Now we're going to look at our final extension to the simple functional. So we're looking at a functional of this form here. So let's talk our way through this functional and we'll get an idea of what it's telling us. So the simple functional that we dealt with before is a function of our independent variable x and we have our y as a function of x and y derivative as a function of x and that's all by dx. So we had one independent variable here which is x. That meant that we would start off with an extremal here. So let's draw the extremal there. And we had our x here. We would have our y here. And the points here would go to that point there. And that point would go to that point there. But now instead of having, having an extremal which is a curve, the extremal is also dependent on another value here. Let's say we call it y. So that would mean that instead of having an extremal curve, we're actually going to have an extremal surface. So that curve there becomes a surface in 3D space. So this is our extension then to our simple functional. We're changing the functional from a function of one variable x. In this case here, we'll look at it in terms of two variables x and y. So that means we're going to have the double integral. So it has to be a double integral because we're integrating it uh, both respect to x and also with respect to y. So we're going to have our function of x and y and the up this axis here would no longer be our y. We'd have another variable here which would be our z. So this is our z as a function of x and y. And we're also going to have the values of p and q. So p and q is the rate of change of z with respect to x. And q is the rate of change of z with respect to y. So this is our new functional form here. So again, we've drawn it out down below. We've got, in this case here, we've got an x, we've got our y and our z axis. So in this simple functional case here, we would start off with a curve here, which would have been given by our eta of x. But instead of having a curve here, eta of x, we're going to start off with not a function eta of x, but we're going to have our eta of both x and y. So instead of having a, a family of curves, epsilon eta x of y, we're going to have a family of surfaces. So our family of surfaces, the boundary point of the surface is going to be a value of zero, in the same sense that the boundary of our simple eta of x is going to be zero at this point and this point, but now it's going to be zero all the way around the boundary. And we're going to have some little surface here. So this surface here is going to get added on to the original extremal surface when it'll give us our second surface here. And that's what I've got drawn down here. We've got our Epsilon eta x and y, which is our family of surfaces. So this is the thing that we add on in order to generate the variation. So we'll have our original extremum, which is the surface here, which is given by the value s. So you can see here that we've got our now s of both x and y. We add on to that the epsilon eta x of y. So we're adding on this family of surfaces or one particular value of it dependent on epsilon and that's the little dotted surface that we have here. So let's say for example we had a point P on the original surface which is the solid yellow line then that P would, P would move up to some point say P1 on the new surface. Now the new surface is given by Z so in effect then we're going to have a 
three dimensional surface here, which is given by our s of x, y, we're going to have our family of curves, which is going to be given by our epsilon, eta x of y here, and when we add both of them together, we're going to get the new value, which will be the extremal plus the variation, and that's the variation here, and we can call that new surface z. So take your time and work through that and have a think about it. All we're doing is taking the original derivations of the Euler-Lagrange equation for one independent variable x, and we're extending it to two independent variables. So instead of having an extremal line, we're going to have an extremal surface. Instead of ha adding on a function e to of x, we're going to add on a function of eta x and y, which in effect is a surface. And that's going to give us our variation. So it means then that we can say that our variation delta i is going to be the original functional here. And we're taking that original functional away from the fu original functional plus the variation. So we can see here that we've added the variation on here to this simple functional. So our x and y are, are independent variables. They'll remain the same. Now, the z here for this value up here, this z here is going to be the surface. So in order to create the new surface, we take the original extremal surface and we have to add on the variation. Now, the variation is going to be our epsilon eta. Now, I've dropped the x and y here because we know it's a function of x and y, so I've just written it simply as epsilon eta. So we're going to have our s plus epsilon eta. So remember, this s plus epsilon eta is the value of z, which is the new surface here, which is the dotted surface. Now, we're also going to have to add on the variation onto the values of our p and the values of our q. So we do that by having the value of our p, and we're going to have to add on our eta of x and our eta of y onto the p and the q. So we'll have our epsilon times our, now in this case here, it's not going to be our eta of x because we're looking at that in terms of our partial z by partial x. So it's going to be our d eta by dx, and this one will be our d eta by dy. So take your time and think over that one there. That's something that's uh, slightly different and slightly new, and you won't have seen that particular addition of the variation before. Now what we want to do is we want to rewrite this in terms of the uh, first order Taylor approximation. So let's go ahead and we'll do that on the next page. So let's take our time and we'll work through this page of maths here. We said that we're going to look at the variation, and the variation was the original functional taken away from the original functional plus the variation. So if you like to think about this as the original extremum, which is going to be a surface in 3D space, and we're going to have the original extremum plus a variation, so that's going to be another surface in the 3D space. But remember that the boundary points of this surface are the same as the boundary points of this surface. So if you like, what we actually have is something that we would call a capping surface. So we would have our original surface here, and then we would have another surface that the boundary would remain the same, but the heights within that boundary will have changed. So we're going to have some form of capping surface. So we're going to have a different surface sitting on top of this surface, but the outer points all remain the same. Now we're going to write this in terms of the Taylor expansion, so the first order Taylor expansion. So let's go ahead and we'll talk about uh, that just now. So let me get rid of this here just to give us a bit more space. Now we've already talked about this before in a previous video. Uh, so again, this is just a bit of a recap. 
Uh, we want to write this here in terms of the first order Taylor expansion. So the first order Taylor expansion for a simple function, we've seen if we had a function here of say x and that's y, and we drew the function out like this here, and we picked a point here, we could find the gradient at that point there. The gradient at that point there would be our df by dx. Now if we take the gradient at that point there, and we multiply it by some distance, so let's say the distance is epsilon, then we could draw the tangent in here, we would have the gradient at this point here, and we multiply it by some distance along this axis, which is epsilon, so we multiply that by epsilon, and that's going to be approximately equal to, and it's going to be this little height here. Okay, so that little height here is going to give us the value of f of x plus epsilon minus f of x. So it's actually going to be exactly equal to that thing there. Okay, so we'll have, we'll have this little height here, but this little height here we know is not the actual next point on this curve. We're going, we could generate a, a second order approximation, which would be given by our epsilon squared upon 2 factorial, and we could get a third order, fourth order, and so on and so forth. But we only need to look at this first order Taylor exp uh, approximation. So we've got our epsilon here, so there's our epsilon there, but our df by dx is not a, we've not got a simple uh, function here, we've actually got our uh, functionals, okay? So our functionals are going to be our, uh, our uh, partial f in this case here, and instead of x here, the only thing that's actually uh, changing is the, that changes the uh, variation is the value of epsilon. So we're going to differentiate each of these terms here with respect to epsilon. And you can see here that the right hand side of this, f of x plus epsilon minus f of x, well that's analogous to what we have up here. We're going to have the original f of x here, and we would have a f of x plus epsilon. But of course in this case our epsilon's the actual uh, given by the, the, the variation. So that's our uh, talk over the Taylor, first order Taylor approximation, and again that should be a bit of revision. So we're going to have to differentiate these terms here with respect to epsilon. So we, if we differentiate x with respect to epsilon, well x is not a function of epsilon, it's the independent variable, so it just gives a value of zero. Y is not a function of epsilon. Uh, it's just the independent variable, it gives us a value of zero. Now this here is going to s plus epsilon eta as our value z, which is our uh, surface, or if you like our capping surface. Of course, that is going to be affected by epsilon. As we change the value of epsilon, then that capping surface uh, is going to change. So we don't need to differentiate f with respect partial f by partial epsilon, uh, of this function here, s plus epsilon eta. And we're going to, again, differentiate this term here with respect to epsilon, because this is go going to be a function of epsilon, and also this term here is going to be a function of epsilon. So we have to differentiate each of these three here. So I could call that one, one. So we've got to differentiate that one there, and we've got to differentiate that one there, and we've got to differentiate this one here. But you can see here that 2 and 3 are actually just ostensibly the same. So once we've differentiated this one, uh, this other one here will just be exactly the same, or just be uh, very similar. So the thing about this here as well is that we, we're going to differentiate our functional with respect to epsilon. But we're going to have to use the chain rule because our function f is going to be, first of all, going to be a, a function of our value z, and our z is then going to be a function of epsilon. So we can write partial f by partial z, and then we can work out the d uh, z by d epsilon. But what is z? Well, we know that z is just going to be our s plus epsilon eta. So we're going to have to 
differentiate this little term here. So we'll leave our partial f by partial z as it is, and we'll differentiate this here. Now we've seen this multiple times uh, already. So if we were to differentiate this here with respect to epsilon, well, our s is not a function of epsilon. S is our original extremum. So that would give us a value of zero. This here would be a product of uh, two functions, so epsilon and eta. So we use the product rule for differentiation. We differentiate one, multiply it by the other, then differentiate the other, multiply it by the first. So we could look at this and we could say our uh, we could differentiate the epsilon, so we'd have d epsilon by d epsilon, which is just a value of 1 times the value of eta. So that's going to give us a value of eta. And the second one we differentiate would be d eta by d epsilon and multiply it by epsilon. But eta is not a function of epsilon. Eta is a function of our x and y. So that term would just go to 0. So finally, you would just be left with this term here partial f by partial z times the value of eta. Now again, we've seen that whenever we derived the original Euler-Lagrange equation. Now the next term here is a little bit more involved, but what we're going to do is work through the same process. We're going to have a, a, a chain rule for differentiation, but what we'll do is we'll replace this whole term here, p plus epsilon d eta by dx, by our value k. So that's just a dummy variable we're going to add in. So we're going to have our partial f by partial k times dk by d epsilon. Now what we'll do is we'll leave the partial f by partial k and then we'll have d by d epsilon, so that's d by d epsilon, of our value k. Well our value k is just this term here. So I've put, that, put this term in here. So again we're going to be left with our partial f by partial k d by d epsilon of, now this value here, p, well, p is nothing other than our uh, dz by dx. But what is our value of z? Well, our value of z is just going to be our s plus epsilon eta. So we're going to be left with our d by dx of our, our s plus epsilon eta. So this term here is just the term p. And then finally, we're just left with our other term here, epsilon d eta by dx. So again, we will leave the partial f by partial k and d by d epsilon, and then we'll do the differentiation here. So the first term here is going to be our ds by dx, so there's our ds by dx, and this term here is going to be the product rule again for differentiation, so we're going to have our d epsilon by dx times eta, so that's d epsilon by dx times eta, and we're going to have our d eta by dx times epsilon, that's d eta by dx times epsilon. Now we're going to have to differentiate each of these terms here with respect to epsilon. Now the first one here, whenever we differentiate the s with respect to epsilon, well s is not a function of epsilon, s is going to be a function of x and y only. So that term there is going to just disappear. Now secondly, we don't even need to do this differentiation here with respect to epsilon for this one because our epsilon here is not a function of x. So this term here just disappears. So we're only going to be left with this final term here. And again, we can use the product rule for differentiation. We're going to have d epsilon by d epsilon, which is just a value of 1, times d eta by dx. So that's the first term, and that's going to give us this d eta by dx here. Now the second part of that ch uh, product rule, we're going to have to differentiate d uh, eta by dx, and also multiply, uh, differentiate it with respect to uh, d epsilon, but the eta is a function of only x and y. It's not a function of epsilon. So that term there is going to disappear as well. So finally, you're only going to be left with this one term here, and that's going to give us this term, partial f by partial k times d eta by dx. So take your time to work your way through that. If you get stuck and you're unsure, you can always get in contact. Now we're going to do exactly the same for this term here. 
and I'm not going to talk through it because it's the same process. The only difference is that the value of Q is going to be partial Z by partial Y. So in the end, instead of having the uh, DX at the bottom here, you're going to have the DY and also the dummy variable that I've added in is a value of M. Okay, so M is this entire section here. So what we want to do now is take our three terms, this term here, and this term here, and this term here, and we want to place it back into our Taylor expansion up here. Okay, so I've done that in the next page. So I've gone ahead and I've put the three terms that we've derived in the previous slide inside the uh, double integral and we're multiplying that by our epsilon and that's by dx dy. So this here is our Taylor expansion, so the first order Taylor expansion. Now we know that as epsilon tends towards zero then the value for z which is in effect our capping surface, so this is our original extremum plus the variation it's just going to tend towards the original extremum, which is the value of S. Our K is going to tend towards P and M is going to tend towards Q. So we can rewrite what we have here uh, down below. Now we know whenever we worked out the uh, Euler-Lagrange equation that we wanted to separate the values of, of eta out from this equation. So if we could take eta out of this bracket, then we know eta of X and Y is go not going to be equal to zero because e to the x or y is going to be our uh, surfaces which we are using in order to generate our variation. So it means that whatever is left with inside this bracket is going to be the differential equation that you're going to have to satisfy in order to ensure that we have an extremal surface. Now, we're going to have to use integration by parts, but we're going to have to use it in terms of two variables in order to separate our, our eta x and y. Now, in order to do that, what we're going to do is go over something called uh, Green's theorem. So we'll use Green's theorem in order to uh, work through and separate out these values of eta. But that's enough for this video. On the next video, we'll work through Green's theorem and then we'll apply Green's theorem to this in order to separate out and find the final differential equation, which in effect will be the Euler-Lagrange equivalent for this uh, functional of two independent variables. So that's all for this video. Thank you for listening. I'll get you in the next video. Goodbye.